One of the more fun of the Cavalier poets is Sir John Suckling. His life was short, his output uh, moderate, but he, uh, he produced an interesting body of work. His life overlapped with the, uh, with the tumultuous years of uh, Charles I, and he cultivated that relationship to authority. And by, uh, by practicing the kind of poetry that he wrote, he, uh, he bucked up the monarchy in its way. He was a traditionalist at heart, and his style of the Cavalier uh, poetry reflected that. It is a style full of classical illusions, showing off your wit, your education, your class. It is also a style of some lack of seriousness, as if the problems of the world are for the little people. And this is not something to be taken into consideration. He's also styling himself very much in the Italian Renaissance mode of uh, of uh, Castiglione and the uh, and the uh, insistence on sprezzatura, the appearing to do to uh, to make no effort at all in anything one does, to be absolutely nonchalant. That undergirds, I would say, the, uh, the, the monarchic reign of the Stuarts because it was a fairly decadent, uh, uh, it was a fairly decadent throne from James through Charles. And the, the uh, pursuit of pleasure was taken very seriously. Uh, and, and, and that kind of, a uh, pose of Epicureanism very distinctly slides into a kind of, of decadence and hedonism. And you see that in the world-weary, fleshy, uh, bon vivant attitude of suckling. And it is a, uh, it is a paradigmatic example of uh of libertine literature where you refuse to take anything terribly seriously especially something so tyrannical as uh as notions of love as abstractions of love and you indulge in your pleasures as a kind of social defiance against taking things too seriously and that voice is so prominent in everything he does. Uh, take a look at, I prithee spare me, gentle boy. I prithee spare me, gentle boy. Press me no more for that slight toy, that foolish trifle of a heart. I swear it will not do its part, though thou dost thine, employest thy power and art. For through long custom it has known the little secrets and is grown sullen and wise, will have its will, and like old hawks pursues that still, that makes least sport, flies only where it can kill. Some youth that has not made it his story will think perchance the pain's the glory, and mannerly sit out love's feast. I shall be carving of the best, rudely call for the last course for the rest. And oh, when once that course is past, how short a time the feast doth last. Men rise away and scarce say grace, or civilly once thank the face that did invite, but seek another place. That is fun. That is a, uh, a celebration of sensuality, a cele celebration of um, a kind of physical presence in the world and enjoyment of that physicality uh, and, and the rejection of uh, ardor, the rejection of uh, pain. Uh, some youth that has not made his story will think perchance that pains the glory. And the whole ethos of the Cavalier poet is that, no, there is no dignity in suffering. There is no honor in pain. 
we're all supposed to just enjoy ourselves. And that is coming out. And he is playing this part, and you can see it in uh, as a uh, as a continuation of the really Shakespearean sonnet pose of the uh, the knowledge of one who has been in love. You look at love with a bit of a gimlet eye. You're not swept away from it. You're eyeing it really more for what it really is. And that tends to be reduced out of an abstract notion of divinity and everything that is special and noble in the world to something more like well, uh, companionship and physical attraction. And those are the sorts of, um, those are the elements that uh, the Cavaliers are dealing with. And that physicality is always present in their work. Look at uh, Love's Offense. If when Don Cupid's dart doth wound a heart, we hide our grief and shun relief, the smart increaseth on that score, for wounds unsearched but rankle more. Then if we whine, look pale, and tell our tale, men are in pain for us again. So neither speaking doth become the lover's state, nor being dumb. When this I do descry, then thus think I, love is the fart of every heart it pains a man when tis kept close and others doth offend when tis let loose <laughs> now um the use of the word fart is obviously funny quite frankly or juvenile either way it fits in with the cavalier bon vivant uh attitude and you can get sort of uh, drawn in by that. And those last few lines tend to get extracted an awful lot as a kind of epigram. Love is the fart of every heart. It pains a man when tis kept close, and others doth offend when tis let loose. The uh, it's, it's got a nice little bumper sticker feel to it. But by doing that, by taking it away from uh, the rest of the poem, everything that precedes it, you lose the kind, uh, you lose the very subtle structure at play here, where he is considering, the poet is considering these two possibilities for love, or for the expression of love, or the expression of the pain of love. And where he is considered on the one hand, and this is stanza one, we could suffer in silence. Suffering is not part of the cavalier idea uh, regardless, but the idea of keeping it to yourself. And he looks at it and considers it from a couple of different angles by concluding that, well, no, that just makes us all, uh, all irritating. Who wants to be around somebody who's just moping all the time and withdrawing from everybody else and shunning relief? You know, don't try and cheer me up. Who wants to be around somebody like that? But then in that second stanza, it takes from the other uh, from the other perspective and said, but what if we go and we express ourselves and we share ourselves and we unburden ourselves with our friends? Nobody wants to be around that guy either. And so it resolves in that, in a kind of Hegelian dialectic form, it resolves in that third stanza where love itself is a kind of problem. And whether you keep it to yourself or share it with your friends is almost immaterial. It is ultimately a pain, and pain is to be rejected. So you can see, uh, you can see the sense of fun in, uh, in, in Suckling's work, but don't get necessarily dissuaded from also seeing the subtlety of it, the construction of it, the logic of it, the po Remember, this is also something that is supposed to be showing off your erudition. So if you can frame a three-part argument with a thesis, an antithesis, and a synthesis at the end, then you are expressing a kind of intellectualism that uh, peacocks out your erudition. Loving and beloved, 
There never yet was honest man that ever drove the trade of love. It is impossible, nor can integrity our ends promove. For kings and lovers are alike in this, that their chief art in reign dissembling is. Here we are loved, and there we love. Good nature now and passion strive, which of the two should be above, and laws unto the other give. So we false fire with art sometimes discover that the true fire with the same art do cover. What rack can fancy find so high? Here we must court and here engage, though in the other place we die. Oh, tis torture all and cousinage, and which the harder is I cannot tell, to hide true love or make false love look well. Since it is thus, God of desire, give me my honesty again, and take thy brands back and thy fire. I am weary of the state I am in, since in the very, if the very best should now befall, love's triumph must be honor's funeral. <laughs> Which, you can go into that a number of different ways, but what is, uh, I think, the most uh, pressing part of that poem, the most significant part of that poem, is the rejection of love outright, the rejection of something higher, the participation in something more elevated, that rejection of the Petrarchan ideal of love, and a reduction of it to just being difficult, uh, just being not worth it, the pains of love render the joys nugatory there's no there's no balance there and in this you are channeling a certain bit of the uh, the epicurean ideal where the tumultuousness of being in love the tumultuous of emotionalism is uh, a a negative and so you seek to find a calm, an even keel, a somewhat uh, reserved, ambivalent attitude towards something like love. Now, this slides very quickly into cynicism, and from there, as, as I said, a kind of hedonism. If you dispel the idea of the emotional turmoil of love, it becomes very quickly just a physical transaction. And that um, can be seen as a uh, somewhat cavalier attitude, to coin a phrase, not really, but also a somewhat misogynist attitude, quite frankly, because these are men writing to other men uh, about their attitudes towards women. And there is something distinctly unsavory about that. So it is not just the, uh, the attitude towards love that they're expressing, but an attitude towards women and towards commitment and towards settling down and all that stuff. Why do all that when you can just get over with a woman what you need to, and then you go back to your friends and write a nice poem about it and can be very casual and uh, rafish about it. Out upon it. Out upon it! I have loved three whole days together and am like to love three more if it prove fair weather. Time shall molt away his wings ere he shall discover in the whole wide world again such a constant lover. But the spite on it is no praise is due at all to me. Love with me had made no stays had it any but had it had it any been but she. Had it any been but she and that very face, there had been at least ere this a dozen dozen in her place. Arguably more misogyny, uh, more of the pose, let's say, let to be kind, the pose of the man about town, the lover on the loose, the love him and leave him kind of guy, and the, um, the, the somewhat... Um, casual attitude towards sexual uh, involvement, quite frankly. I have loved three whole days together and am like to love three more. Uh, 
he's just counting the days and not really referencing is that with one woman or with multiple and that last line of that uh that first uh that first um stanza if it proved fair weather now this could be a couple of things now if it's really rainy and rotten or cold out and he doesn't want to go out and about to meet new people or to uh, visit old friends let's say then that could be a factor but also one has to recall that you know at this time and place in london especially in some of the seedier parts like covent garden or 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 some of the uh, the inns and stuff like that uh prostitution was a very real trade being plied in the streets and you could find uh dark alleyways and shadowy corners where you can go get it over with as he seems to be suggesting here and then move on with your day so if it proved fair weather if it's really raining outside you're gonna get soaked while you are hiring a hooker uh the the that attitude i think is undercurrent in this that possibility that there is a prostitution uh angle here or at least a woman of easy virtue you could say because here he's saying that you know if not her then i'll go with somebody else he seems to have a significant supply at hand and this is not something that he's at all concerned with there are no names in this there are only pronouns and the that cavalier attitude again uh, a dozen dozen in her place he's flaunting his sexual promiscuousness uh if she's not here i can go get 24 others or or a dozen dozen which is what 144 um that's you know morally suspect it is a flaunting of morals these same kinds of ideals that society is based on that the cavaliers are in essence disparaging they are conservative politically but morally very much uh well that's for the little people and parallels to that can be seen throughout history where they are staunchly for the royal established cultural political power base that undergirds their society and their privilege but at the same time they're not going to worry themselves with all of this now you can also say and this is very dangerous to go down the uh the road of uh, the the cavalier belief system you can also very much say that by flaunting that attitude by making it so conspicuous a an element of your uh of your aesthetic by celebrating it so brazenly you are in a way holding it up to ridicule maybe suckling is being ironic here maybe the cavaliers are doing this all as a bit of a pose as as a critique of their society as a uh, look at me can you really believe what an awful awful person i am uh and that i can get away with all of this there is that possibility and i wouldn't dissuade anybody from uh engaging with that idea but the uh the, the cornerstone of the cavaliers is always that pose always that devil may care let the party go on i'm just here to have a good time eat drink be merry and don't worry about all of the other little problems that come up that attitude is the cavalier aesthetic in its entirety